This is episode 38 of Road Noise, Life One Mile at a Time. Disney Hacks, 15 Ways to Make the Mouse More Magical. Hello and welcome again to another episode of Road Noise, Life One Mile at a Time. I'm your host, Michael Blackston. You're riding alongside me in the passenger seat on my commute to and from work. This time, I'm on the way from Conway, South Carolina, by way of Sumter, South Carolina. And if you hear something like the sound of a rumble under the sound of my voice, that's just the sound of the road, hence the reason we call it road noise. We're learning to live life one mile at a time. And in episode 37, you heard all about my family's trip to Disney World, the Magic Kingdom, Epcot Center, and Hollywood Studios. That was last week. We had a blast, and I told you all about it. Kind of summed it up in a Cliff Notes version and gave you some sound effects. As I was listening to the episode, I was listening back to it on my trip up here to Conway, and I noticed at the end of the episode, I talked about how my wife and I had decided to come back in January to the Disney World theme parks, kind of on a honeymoonish kind of thing. And I mentioned that you heard that in a sound bite and I just kind of went past it and I realized that I had forgotten a portion of the story and I'm not going to go all into it basically it was a section that I was going to do in the telling of our trip that was about how my daughter had had a stinky <laughs> for lack of a better term right after we got got off of the Peter Pan ride and my wife took her to the bathroom and my daughter is three years old and right now if you've ever had a three-year-old you know that a lot of stuff just don't make sense and they can pitch a fit for no reason at all and she started pitching a fit because she had to have a diaper change to the point that my wife had to call me to the girl's women's bathroom and tell me to go get my mom or my sister because she needed help. She couldn't handle my daughter. My daughter was kicking and screaming and disrupting and other people were waiting to change their children and it was a mess. And that all happened while I was recording a soundbite on my phone. And it was during that point when I had mentioned that my wife and I were having such a good time we had decided to come back. And I forgot to actually put that in, but then I referenced it at the end of last week's episode. Well, really, the episode that was kind of at the beginning of this week, if I'm not mistaken, I released it on Saturday, I think, is when I released episode 37 that told about our Disney World trip. So, if you did listen to that podcast, you know that I mentioned episode 38 would probably be our Disney Hacks episode. And it was something that I put together during the week. Anytime I would see something that we did or get a good idea just looking around at the situation around me, I would make a note in my Evernote app because I knew that I wanted to do a Disney World Hacks episode. And that's exactly what this episode is. And I'm going to jump right into it. If you have ever thought of going to Disney World, taking your family there, or maybe you've already got a trip planned and and maybe this popped up because you typed in keywords of Disney World hacks or whatever. Anyway, however you came to this episode, if Disney World is anywhere in your future, this might be something to uh, think about on these items that I've noticed as we were having our family trip to Disney World last week. And there are 15 ways that I think you can help yourself have a little bit better experience. Make the mouse more magical, as I titled the subtitle of this episode. And let's start with number one. Number one, we didn't do this, but I wish we had, and when we go back, we will. Coolers. Did you know you're allowed to take coolers into Disney World? It's a big deal because my wife and I were talking about it, and we said, when we go back, we're going to pack lunches. A family of four just eating at the little restaurants anywhere in the park. I'm going to be honest with you. I was never blown away by the food at any of them. And and really, why should you be? You're not in a situation where you've got top chefs working to get the perfect meal out. The, these people are just spitting out meal after meal after meal for people in line. 
and it was in June, so there were a lot of people that they were trying to feed at one time. This these meals weren't that great. They were just spitting them out one right after the other. However, I never paid less than $50 for a family of four to eat a hamburger and fries apiece. And that's a lot of money when you're going to be spending just that on lunch. When I could have brought a cooler and packed our lunches in it and saved a lot of money. And I found out that you can do that. So that's hack number one. You can take a cooler. Now, there are some things you need to keep in mind when you take a cooler. You can't lug that huge igloo cooler that you're going to take to your July 4th party. You can't lug a huge plastic cooler like that. There are limits, but there's not really any limits to what food you can bring or how many meals you can bring as long as you can pack them into a cooler up to a certain size. And that size is... 24 by 15 by 18 inches that's 24 inches by 15 inches by 18 inches if you can get everything you need into a cooler of that size then you're good to go they'll check it now there are checkpoints when you go into the Disney World parks at every single one of them and they check your bags if you have bags you have to open them and let them look at them they're what they're checking for is weapons guns anything like that And just as a a side note, something that a lot of people were finding out the hard way when we went, selfie sticks are banned at the Disney World parks now. You cannot take a selfie stick in. It could be used as a weapon, they assume. Selfie sticks are banned. They will make you leave them. And they mention it when you get on the tram. They mention it anytime there's an opportunity to. Don't take your selfie stick. But that's neither here nor there. Just another tip I wanted to give you. Now... You cannot take alcoholic beverages or anything that's got alcohol in it, and you cannot take glass containers. So everything needs to be in plastic, Tupperware, baggies, whatever. Got to be plastic or something like that. No glass containers and no alcohol. The only glass containers they do allow are baby food jars. And now this is according to a website I found, and I can't remember what it was called. I want to say it was DisneyFoodNerds.com or something like that. I'm not sure. But anyway, it was a website that knew all about this stuff and so currently right now no glass no alcohol except for baby food glass containers and i said that backward you can't take alcohol in baby food glass containers let me let me rephrase that no alcohol and no glass containers with the exception of baby food glass containers and your cooler cannot be over the size 24 inches by 15 inches by 18 inches so keep all of that in mind Now, what would you take in your cooler besides a meal that could be really handy? Well, bottles of water would be one thing. You're probably not going to be able to get a full day's worth of bottles of water, especially if you're going in the summertime into a cooler that size. But there are some tips and hacks to getting yourself and keeping yourself hydrated in the parks without having to pay the three to four dollars per bottle of water that you will have to pay if you pay for the park's water. Hold on to your cups and water bottles. For one thing, if you bring them in or if you do buy a bottle of water, don't just throw it away when you're done. There are water fountains all over the park where you can refill your water bottles once you've emptied them, once you've drank them all. You can just keep refilling them. Now, the water's not going to be ice cold. It's going to be lukewarm, and it doesn't taste great in all of the places but it is drinkable and if it's something where you just need to keep something sipped on something to keep you hydrated it's a great idea to not have to spend three dollars every single time that you buy a bottle of water same goes for your cups when you do go to those restaurants and they'll give you a cup and most of the time they'll fill it up with the drink that you order but if you keep your cup and your lid and your straw and all that you can just fill it back up at the water fountains and that's number two hold on to your cups and water bottles One trick my sister realized, we went to one place at Hollywood Studios right inside the Star Wars area where the drink fountains were self-service. You ordered your drink, they gave you a cup, and you filled the drink up yourself. And so my sister kept her cup and went back three or four times into that restaurant because there's, it's just open air restaurant with doors all over the place. And she just walked back in, nobody asked any questions, and she just kept filling hers up with Sprite. So you can do that. I'm not saying to steal, but I'm just saying that's a hack you can keep in mind. Hold on to your cups and your water bottles, and you can refill them at places. On another note, 
for keeping yourself hydrated and, and, and waterfied. My sister found this out as well. You can go ask for a cup of ice at the little restaurants, and most of the time, or at least for her, they would give them to her for free. And then one time she came back and she had a full cup of ice water, and I said, where'd you get the water? She, uh, I was looking for a fountain, and she said, they filled it for me. I asked for a cup of ice, and they asked what I like water in that. Keep that in mind. You may be able to, if not free, at least get a great deal on just going into one of the little restaurants and asking for a cup of water or a cup of ice. And they may ask if you want water in it, and it probably couldn't hurt to ask if they could put water in it. All they can do is say no, right? So keep that in mind, cafeteria ice. Another thing with water that I found out When we went to Hollywood Studios on the third day, my wife decided she wanted to go into the Starbucks and get a cup of coffee. Now, I don't know why, because it was hot as blue blazes outside, but she wanted some coffee. Maybe it was an iced coffee. I'm not sure. She likes that stuff. I don't like iced coffee, but maybe that's what it was. But anyway, she went into the Starbucks, and I came in behind her after she had already paid, and I asked the guy at the counter, I said, do you have waters? And he said, sure. And he brought out, he went into a refrigerator right behind him and brought out a small cup of water with a lid on it that had already been prepared. And it was full of ice water. And he handed it to me and I said, how much do I owe you? He said, nah, don't worry about it. It's free. There's another idea. The Hollywood Studios Starbucks gave me a free cup of water when I asked for it. So that might be another way you can kind of hydrate there as well. That's number four. On the same note, we bought before we went little fans that hang around our necks on strings. Now, I'm going to be honest, they didn't provide an enormous amount of air. It wasn't just blasting it in our faces. However, it hangs around your neck. You can get them. They, they take a couple of AA batteries, and they, they just have a little vent that blows cool air up into your facial area, and they're a lot less cumbersome than the little squirt bottles with a fan on the end of it. There were a lot of those around Disney World. One of the reasons is they sell them smartly at Disney World and all of the theme parks. They're sitting down, and I think some of them had them sitting in ice, so the water was chilled. And, and as you squeeze the spritz bottle, it's got a little fan on the other side, so the air spins the fan, and it just kind of blows water into your face in a little spray. You can buy those there. But as you know, anywhere in a theme park like that, you're going to pay a premium for it. The neck fans were not that expensive. My wife picked them up. You put a couple of AA batteries in them, and they hang around your neck. You don't have to have them in your hand everywhere you go. Then you can also kind of take it and move it around your face as needed, and uh, it'll cool you off. Okay, it wasn't great, but it was better than nothing. And in the middle of June in central Florida, you want to keep some air circulating around you. That's number six, or number five, I'm sorry, that's number five. You might think about getting a little fan to hang around your neck. And those weren't that heavy either. I was afraid that it might get cumbersome and be a little heavy, but it wasn't that heavy. You barely noticed it once you got uh, going and once you got used to the weight. Not very heavy at all. Now number six, consider going in January. That's when Kayla and I have decided that we're going to go back to Disney World because we have been married for over 20 years, but we've never really had a really good, long honeymoon vacation. We didn't have the money when we got married. We hardly had a pot to pee in, much less go on a long honeymoon. We went to Helen, Georgia for three days. We did everything that there was to do in Helen. And yeah, I know it was your honeymoon. There are other things to do, but even that, you know, it got kind of boring. We ended up driving up to Atlanta for a day, but it just wasn't much of a honeymoon, and we've always wanted that. But we've decided, now having gone in the middle of June, that's never happening again. Now, it wasn't as bad as we expected it to be the first two days. The second two days, however, were blisteringly hot and humid. I won't be doing that again unless somebody pays my way for it. However, they say the lowest attendance is in January. That's when you can go in there are the fewest people right after Christmas. Everybody spent their money on Christmas. They don't have the money to go to Disney World. Most of them don't have the time on their schedules because they've taken time off for holidays and everything. So they're going, uh, or very few people are going in January. So that's when Kayla and I decided we were going to go. I checked, and the temperature on average is in the 60s to 70s down there for the high, and the lows are somewhere around the low to mid 
40s on average that's not really that bad that's kind of chilly at night but a, a good coat will handle things for you it's not like you're going to freeze to death at 60s and 70s during the day. That's just heaven for me. So you might consider going in January where the temperature is better and there aren't as many people. Number seven, hotels are a big concern if you're going to Disney World on a budget. Hotels, staying resorts in the parks, and yes, I understand that there's a lot of amenities and nice things that go with that. But if you're on a budget, if you're going with a large group, consider renting a house this is the way to go. This is what my family did. We had me, my wife, and our two kids as one group uh, or part of the group, family in the group. Then we had my sister and her son and her grandson. That was another section. And then my mom and my stepdad. And that was three parts of a full group. We were nine people total, but we stayed in a house that had four bedrooms three baths, a swimming pool, and a pool table. We stayed there for, let's see, we stayed there Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, and Friday night. So we stayed there five nights, and we only had to pay each 300 something dollars. It was amazing. Now, and, and this was in June. I'm really kind of shocked that that's all we had to pay for this nice house. It was really, really nice. It was clean. It was big and airy. There was plenty of room. Nobody had to, you know, draw straws for the beds or anything like that. There was plenty of rooms. Like I said, three bathrooms. You might consider renting one house with several bedrooms and bathrooms if you're a group of people and then splitting up the cost. That was a big plus for us. Number eight, the My Disney Experience app. Now, my stepdad likes to kind of be the leader in these situations. He's a, a techie guy. He's a gadget geek. He loves that type of stuff, and he loves his smartphone and his apps and everything like that, and he likes to be the kind of guy to organize things and make the best situation possible for everybody. It's kind of his thing. So I didn't really get an opportunity to experience the My Disney Experience app but he did and that's the app he used and he used it for a lot of stuff and he was constantly checking it and apparently it was a very good app he was happy with it so I would suggest that you check into the my Disney experience app it tells you every ride and uh, attraction in the park the wait times you can check the wait times they update constantly for the ride Say you want to go to uh, Space Mountain in Magic Kingdom and you're just getting into the park and you think well maybe we should go there first but you don't want to wait in a long line, you wonder how long it is, you check the My Disney Experience app, it'll tell you exactly how long the wait is. And they do keep that up and accurately because there was twice that I got asked to and once that my son got asked to, just randomly the attendants will hand you a lanyard, uh, a little string with a card to hang around your neck or hold on to, and they'll hand it to you and say, would you hand this to the attendant right before you get on the ride? And basically what it is is they'll clock, they'll hit the timer when they hand it to you, and then when you hand it to the other person, they'll scan it and it'll hit the timer again and it'll, it'll clock the start and stopping point and tell them exactly how long the wait is. And they do that constantly throughout the day so that they can keep up an accurate assessment of how long the waits are for every single attraction. That's just one of the ways that you can utilize the My Disney Experience app. You can also schedule your fast passes and all of that type of stuff. So get the My Disney Experience app for your smartphone or your iPad or whatever you're taking there. It's most likely going to be your smartphone. And use that. That is the number eight Disney hack. Number nine, wheelchairs. After the second day, my mom was dead on her feet. She has problems with her ankles anyway. And after walking all those hours the first and second days we said there's got to be something she is miserable at the end of the day so we convinced her to let us rent her a wheelchair I think it was like 50 bucks for the wheelchair and it may have been 75 80 90 bucks for the scooter there were scooters all over the place too but my mom didn't want to do that she'd rather just have a wheelchair and it was nice because we didn't have to wait on mom 
because she has bad ankles. It slows us down, and that's fine. We weren't worried about it, but we were worried about her. But we found out that if you are a group that, and you're trying to all stay in one group and you have a person in a wheelchair, you can get to the front of line in a few places. Now, I'm not saying to use that as you know a way to get a fast pass. That would be unethical. But if you've got someone who would benefit from being able to be pushed around in the wheelchair you can take turns if there's more than one of you uh, pushing the person around it gives them some relief if they really need it and then you get the extra benefit of in some of the attractions going to uh, a little bit faster area of the line because of the handicapped ass access and they don't want to break up the families and the people who are together so they'll say everybody in the group come this way and we got that. We got to the front of the line at the Frozen Experience. We got to the front of the line at the Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, there were several of them that we were able to just go right on ahead after they realized that my mom was in the wheelchair. That's number nine. Number ten, online resources. There are a myriad of online resources that you can look to to plan your trip. And everything I've read about how to get the best out of your experience going to Disney World has been plan it. Don't just go off the cuff. Now, I, my wife and I, there's a certain romance about going off the cuff that we like, and we're thinking about doing a bit of spontaneity with the next time we go. However, for the most part, especially if you've got a large group, it really helps if you plan ahead. And these online resources, I, I'm not even going to try to list them all. I mean, there well, there's no way to list them all here. There are a bunch of them, but so many Disney online resources that will help you to plan your trip and make it a better experience and and just get you right in, right out, and 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 make everything as beneficial to you as possible. Number 11, something you don't really think about, something we didn't think about until it was too late. Children with diapers, in the heat especially, keep an eye on them. My daughter was in a stroller for most of the time, but it was so hot and so sweaty, she developed a diaper rash. Not much to say about this, just keep in mind that children that are still in diapers are susceptible to diaper rash, and a lot of times it's not something they realize until you put that wet wipe on their butt and they start screaming. And that might be one of the reasons my daughter was not wanting to be changed when she pitched the fit that I told you about at the front of this episode because she was sore and we had to medicate her because it just was the the poor little darling's real rear end was sore and it was due to just the chafing from the sweating and the, the being hot and being in a diaper it's just not fun when it gets to that point so keep an eye on your little ones if they're in diapers and make sure that they don't get a diaper rash and you may not think that's a hack but it is absolutely a hack if it's something that because I told you to you keep it in mind and you avoid the pain and irritation from your darling little one number 12 save phone battery now with smartphones you're thinking I'm gonna just sit there and play a game on my phone or I'm gonna check Facebook and do all that stuff while I'm waiting in line it'll help pass the time and you are absolutely right and if you want to use your phone that's fine I will suggest that if you do uh, take your phone and plan on using it a lot as you wait in those long lines at the parks that you take a mobile charger we took two or three of them and they saved us you can charge them back up overnight, and then when your phone gets low on battery, you just keep a cable with you and your charger in your pocket, and you plug it in, and there you go, or in your bag or whatever you're going to be carrying it in. But I found a better way, for me at least, to spend the time in the lines. Because I'm an artist, I decided to get a small pocket sketchbook, and it was neat. When you're talking and... You know, fellowshipping with the people around you, in your party, in your group, you can't really get any really great detailed sketches, but it is a great way to spend time if you're an artist. Take a pencil and a sketchbook with you. I just kept a pencil clip to the front of my shirt the whole time, the sketchbook in my front pocket, and whenever I found a minute and I was bored in the line, I'd pull that out, and there's never uh, a question of finding something to draw 
at one of the Disney World parks, there's always something that's interesting to sketch. Now, if you're not an artist and you don't want to take a sketchbook that doesn't appeal to you, maybe you're a reader. Take something like that. Take a crossword puzzle book. Anything like that. That's a good way to pass the time. It's simple. It's easy. It's lightweight. You can whip it in and out of your pocket as you're waiting in line and moving along in the line and you don't waste your phone battery because that gets irritating when at the end of the day you have a phone with no life on it. That is, uh, which one is that? Is That's number 12. Save your phone batteries by taking something else to keep you occupied in the lines. Number 13, buy souvenirs on the way out. I heard this from somebody else who has this as sort of their family rule when they go to any sort of a theme park or anywhere they're going to be buying souvenirs like that. Especially with kids, the temptation is you, as soon as you walk in the park, they hit you with the kiosks and all the things they want you to buy. And kids can't help themselves. They see something immediately. Boom. They want to buy it. My son was the same way. My daughter the same way. They want, they want, they want. But what they don't realize is you've got an entire day and an entire park of things to look at and things that you're going to want. You can't necessarily buy everything unless you're a rich guy, and I am not. And I wouldn't buy everything because I don't want to spoil my children that way. I told them they each get a souvenir. Choose wisely because once they get the souvenir, that's their souvenir. So a good rule of thumb is this. No purchases until you're on the way out. When we said, okay... It's time to leave. It's time to head by the, back to the front. If you've seen something, you know you want it, and that's the thing you want, keep an eye on when it is or where it is. Get it on the way out. And most of the, the kiosks have the same things in them. You know, if it's Mickey ears or a goofy hat or something like that, if it's a specialty item, you may have to kind of make a side trip or something. But just it's so much easier to keep your mind on it, and that way you can gauge everything you've seen and decide what it is the you want the most instead of buying something and then being tied down to it because you can't afford to spend on something you found that you wanted better later on. So wait till the end and after you're walking out to buy your souvenirs. You also don't have to lug them around with you. If you're going to buy them at the end of the day, you, you're holding them as you're on your way out. You're not having to hold them and keep up with them wherever you happen to be all throughout the day, which can get irritating. Number 14, ride the popular rides during fireworks and light shows. Now, if you're going to go to the Magic Kingdom, most likely you want to see that light show over the castle. You want to see those fireworks over the castle. But we went two days, or two separate days. We went Monday, uh, no, I'm sorry, we went Tuesday and we went Friday. We did the fireworks Tuesday night. It was our first night there. It was the cap off to our first night. Beautiful experience. You want to stay. You see the fireworks. There's a light show on the castle after the fireworks. We did that on Friday night while everybody else piled toward the castle. And it was just elbow to elbow. And everybody was watching the fireworks. We rode a couple of rides that had normally long lines that we were able to jump right on because everybody was up at the front watching the fireworks over the castle. If you have already seen it or don't care about it, it's a great time to ride some of those rides that you don't want to wait in line, long lines for. Or if it's something that you rode once and loved it so much you want to ride it again, but you don't want to wait in that long line again for it, that's a great opportunity to get in a shorter line. There's probably still going to be somewhat of a wait because other people are doing that, but it will be a fraction of the wait time to ride those lines while everybody's sitting at the front of the park or wherever you are because most of them have some sort of a show at the end of the night whether it's fireworks or a light show or a water show or something like that and finally number 15 get there when the park opens you would be amazed and and i'm kind of stealing this from another a website, but it's absolutely true. You'd be amazed how empty the parks can be right after they open. Go right when they open because a lot of people like us, we were in a large group and a lot of people do travel in groups. And when you travel in groups, it's hard to get everybody up and ready and out and eating breakfast and everything and waiting when the park opens. If you will go ahead and get there when the park opens, you'll be amazed at how quick you can get on some of the rides and then schedule your fast pass uh, rides you can you know you can schedule your fast passes for 
the busier rides later on in the day. You've already rid ridden some of the things early when there weren't as long a lines, and then you schedule your fast passes for the middle part of the day when the lines are the longest, and you can make the most out of your time. So those are 15 hacks that I feel like will help you make the most and make your mouse more magical if you go to the Disney World theme parks, if there's anything in your future, and, and I hope it is. It's a wonderful experience. It's an expensive experience. I don't think anybody is going to um, be naive enough to think they're going to go and not spend a mint there. But some of these things can help you, whether it's saving your time for your budget uh, or saving your money for your budget or your time for your budget of your time. Because you may not have four days in the parks. You may only have two. You may only have one, depending on where you live and maybe you're passing through. Some of these things can help you make the most out of the experience, get the most out of your experience, and maybe keep a little bit of the money in your pocket and a little more time in your day. So I hope that helped. I want to give you a positive review in this one. That's another thing I noticed in episode 37. I completely forgot the positive review, which was fine because it went 40 minutes. and This one's already going over 30. So... A positive review, I want to give you another podcast, and it's one of my absolute favorite podcasts now, and it's just all fluff. But it is a little bit of a neat inside look at the world of stand-up comedy. The podcast is called Potty Break, P-O-D-D-Y, Break, with Tim Hawkins. Tim Hawkins is one of my all-time favorite comedians. He, I don't think... He likes to be considered a Christian comedian. He doesn't necessarily want to be labeled that. Often he is because he is a Christian. His comedy is clean. It's something you can uh, share with the entire family. He does a lot of churches, but he also does a lot of big venues. He's getting to be a very popular comedian, and he's absolutely hilarious. Well, Potty Break is a podcast that he and his crew have just started, and a lot of times they'll do the podcast right on the bus after a show or right before a show, and it's just them talking. It's like a morning zoo type crazy comedy thing. They're, they're sitting around microphones on the bus talking about whatever, and a lot of times they'll have guest comedians that are on tour with them that'll join in, but they're just having a good time. The thing is long. You can listen to it in little bits and pieces or the all at once like I do. It's usually 70 to 80 minutes long. It's a great podcast, and it's one that you don't have to be ashamed to listen to, but it is one that if you like guys being crazy and goofy like I do, I think you'll like it. So it's Potty Break with Tim Hawkins. Look that up the next time you're looking for a brand new podcast to listen to. So if you've got anything you'd like to add, do you have a Disney hack that I didn't mention? Something that, because I'm a newbie at this Disney thing. I'm not the guy who knows all the ins and outs of Disney World. We've decided we're going to go every couple of years. I'm going back in January with my wife, so I'm hoping to become a Disney expert on this. And who knows, maybe one day there'll be a podcast all about Disney hacks. Who knows? Maybe, maybe I'll do that. I don't know. Anyway, if you have something that I didn't mention and you want to get back in touch with me anyway, for any reason, here's how you do it. You can get in touch with me via email at feedback at michaelblackston.com or you can call me via the hotline at 706-408-7456. You can also contact me at michaelblackston.com. Stream the podcast live. Subscribe on iTunes straight from the podcast at roadnoisepodcast.com. And please do me a favor, share me. Share me. If you found this interesting, if you like the podcast, if you're saying I'm going to subscribe to him, do me a favor, share me on Facebook, on the Road Noise Podcast dot com website by the way there are social media buttons where you can instantly share every single episode individual episodes please go share them just hit that share button and help me find new friends just like you who can ride alongside me in the passenger seat as we learn to live life one mile at a time i'm michael blackston until the next episode thank you for listening and we'll see you then